everybody, this is Grant with State of the Spark, and I'm super, super pumped to have Austis Helmsdotter. Did I say that okay? Yes, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Three-time Olympic javelin competitor, correct? Yeah. Did you medal in any of them? No, but I was in the finals in London. The finals in London. Awesome. And you know what? I, I want to get into some of these things. We were talking about, to the people watching, we were talking about some awesome stuff we're going to circle back to real quick, but I do want to give you an overview of who Austias is and what she's touched on and why I'm super pumped to have her on the, on the show. Um, but real quick, like, what is competing? No, I want to back up further. When did you start training for the Olympics and why? For the Olympics? Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to say it was back in 2001 where I was like fully on focus, like now I'm going to train and I want to become an Olympian. But I announced in my kitchen back home when I was 10 <laughs> years old that I was going to compete in the Olympics. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it you started just, pretty early. But like, had you been training this? Whole, I mean, in general, you're an athletic person. Like, had it been javelin the whole time? So I started with badminton and that was like, I started with sports when I was 10. I was like, not super young. And that was when I just like, oh, this is like, I want to be the best, you know, get this feeling right away. And then I started with athletics or track and field uh, a little bit later. Mm. And, and then I just got like more and more and more into it. And I kind of started training like full on, full time. Like I'm going to go pro when I was uh, just about to turn 16. Then it was like, I'm going to make the Olympics. <laughs> so what, like, to those watching, we were just talking, and there's kind of like this fire in Alstis, <laughs> right? And so we were talking briefly about, she observed that there's a lot of entrepreneurship, but she was, she was raised, she was not raised around entrepreneurship and business and trades. And I mentioned some stuff and she mentioned that, no, there's a lot of entrepreneurship. And I saw a lot of trades people, a lot of people in fishing obviously people in tourism, especially the young people, but that led me to a question that I was going to ask next. And that is where did this fire, whether it's competitive or not, competitiveness or not, where did this fire in you come from? Oh God, I don't know. I think it's, it's hereditary. Like we really? are all like this in my family. Like it's a lot of fire in us, but it comes with some downsides. We're all super stubborn as well, but <laughs> I mean, you don't train for something for 20 years without being stubborn. <laughs> no. And you said it's hereditary, but your dad, what did your father do? My father, he was like, he was an athlete himself. He okay. did some Icelandic wrestling and he okay. did a little bit of track and field as well himself and handball and different sports. Okay. But he was never like, I mean, he had four kids and it was, you know, he's born in 49. So it was back in the 70s, 80s. Like he was not, you couldn't go pro. It was no, nothing like that, but he okay. was always super athletic. Interesting. Now, are your siblings as aggressive as you were? They're as aggressive, but they don't put it into sports. <laughs> no? So, like, give me an example yeah. of what they put it into. No, no, it's not like that. I just mean, like, we have all this in the fire. Like, we have a big temper. <laughs> we're stubborn. Like, that kind of thing. Okay, <laughs> that kind. I see. I see. So, you went, you decided to go pro. And the, the reason I'm glad you're on the show is for those watching, I, I really like to hear about excellence and what it takes. And right now... Ausdis kind of shared she's pivoting and we'll we'll share your website here in a second about some of the talks and training she's doing but I want you to picture this imagine what it takes to train for the Olympics then add to that a PhD in immunology right and then starting your business which I do want to hear about as well so you take on a lot and I find that people of excellence they learn the principles of excellence in one domain and then they start expanding that in others and it becomes scalable to a degree because it's principles so give me an idea, and this is one of the questions I had somewhere, what were one of the earlier challenges that were non-athletic, that were Ooh. more internal? Give me an idea of one of the early challenges you had as you were training for the Olympics, resistance or whatever you call it. What were some of the earlier challenges? Uh, I gotta say it was mindset. Like that's, that's why I love talking about mindset and, mm. you know, helping others with everything that I have learned because I wasn't always there. I didn't always have the best mindset mm. and everything with setting goals and, and all of this is something that I had to learn through experience 
mm. over the past 20 years. Like I said before, like I have a big temper and I am definitely stubborn. So I struggled a lot in the beginning if I wasn't doing so well. Like if I had a bad training session or when I got injured, that mm. was mentally super tough for me. And, and so, did, did you lash out? Did you beat yourself up or did you blame others? How did that manifest? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame others. No, I would just get super, super disappointed with myself. I've always had very high expectations of myself mm. so that, you know, when I wasn't living up to those expectations, I would sometimes like go into a little bit of a negative spiral and mm. tear myself down wow. and I couldn't, you know, keep on like that. So no. I had to learn a way to get through it and how to deal with these emotions. And was there a turning point been, for that or a teacher that came into your life that shared that or is that a progressive lesson? It was a very progressive lesson, but I'm going to say that it kind of transformed when I started working with a sports psychologist regularly. Really? Yeah. yeah. Cause oh, then when was that? So I, I worked with her briefly in 2012, but I started again working with her and we have been working absolutely consistently since 2000, early 2016. Wow. So this was a turning point for you. Yeah. Now, what did it look like? Was it more like counseling sessions or, or was it consultative? Like, what did that look like? So we, we have sessions, uh, well, usually about every two weeks. Wow. Where we just go through, like, she is, is giving me a lot of tools, how to deal with, like, it dep depends a little bit on the struggles or, you know, what, what am I dealing with at that moment? Mm. And then we are basically seeing how we can deal with that. And mm. she's giving me tools that I can use and she's giving me projects. And one of the things that I have loved about that mm -hmm. is that I'm very logical, like I'm a logical person. Okay. So she has leveraged that a lot. <laughs> so the way that she works with me is that she has me write down my thoughts a lot. Okay. And every time, you know, I'm doing some project and I'm writing down and when, when you have your thoughts, you know, going in circles in your mind, it, it's very easy to feel very emotional about it. But once yeah. you've written them down on a piece of paper or on your computer or whatever, then it's easier to take a little step back and you take a look at the situation. You're not so emotionally in the middle of it yeah and then you can kind of organize your thoughts a little bit and it's easy to see oh yeah you know this is actually not as bad as it feels because i'm you know feeling the feeling a lot more i'm not i can't be logical with this if that wow. makes any sense <laughs> oh yeah well and did you do any journaling before that no that's really? also that's also another thing that has been huge for me and now i've started doing a gratitude journal as well yeah, and every my, day. I have a gratitude <laughs> mug I wear. Okay. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah, so it. So <laughs> I do that every day, three things every day. And, and this has also helped me a lot with like a positive attitude and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. So wow. everything that I, I've kind of had to like take little pieces here and there to, mm. to work on specific situations around the sports and all those yeah. challenges. And it has taught me so much that that's why I started my business and I started speaking because I'm like, it's a shame that I don't share this. Yes. It took me 20 years to learn this and yeah. I can save people so much time by sharing this knowledge. So in coaching, I'm sure you've heard the term or personal development coaching. I'm sure you've heard the term uh, conscious competence, unconscious competent, unconscious mm -hmm. incompetent conscious incompetent and there's kind of different tiers of awareness and you seem like a very aware person it seems like you've surrounded yourself with some sharp people just hearing about the psychologist quick question on this though like it takes a lot to get just to the olympics right yes. um let alone be at that tier of competition of your peers did anyone else from iceland go to the olympics for javelin or track and field like did you have relationships with any of the other competitors I mean, of course, the sports community in Iceland yeah. isn't that big. So sure. I got to know the people going to the Olymp like the other people going to the Olympics. We're yeah. a small, tight group, but it's not like, you know, I knew them before and then sure. we went to the Olympics together. It's more like gotcha. we're going to the Olympics. That's how we got to know each other. <laughs> to your knowledge, are, are other competitors at least going to the Olympics as consciously competent as you are in your, psych your, your mental journey? Are they all talking about the same stuff or are they just sheer brute force and sheer talent and they just come up or are they as conscientious as you are? 
I think you just see the whole scale, really. Like really? some some people really dive into that. And of course you can have people that are not, I mean, I wasn't that far along on my journey when I went to my first Olympics back in 2008. Okay. And then like, and I was a little further along in 2012 and then there was a whole nother ball game in 2016. Interesting. So I wasn't the same person throughout all of these Olympics either. <laughs> Interesting. So, you know, cause you know, as a coach, I'd like to think that it's the ultimate edge, self-awareness and personal development, but maybe not. Maybe it's your edge, but someone else might come out with total genetics or they might have the funding for top-notch trainers or something like that. And that's their edge, but it's the edge you bring. So you see the full spectrum. It, now, is it a trait of some of the more um, seasoned competitors that they have this head game thing like you have? or even the seasoned competitors are across the spectrum. Yeah, I would say they're also across the spectrum because it's really, it's, you know, people are different. Some yeah. people like this, just, they don't like this kind of stuff. And some mm -hmm. people, you know, are more into that. It's just yeah. the same with athletes. But I think the, cause you say that, you know, this is, you know, my leverage and, and mm -hmm. some people might have some other things, but I think that, to reach your full potential as sure. an athlete, then everybody should tap into this. Because mm. I think whoever is not tapping into this is not reaching their full potential. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah, I agree. That's wild. So, so it's like, even if you have so much physical talent and you get to a very high level, you could always go further if, you, if your mind is in the game as well. And you know, I mean, you're around elite athletes and I'm sure other domains of elite people. I've been around elite coaches and speakers and trainers. And I am, I, I do marvel at, from a speaker's perspective, there's some people that just have, they were born a good speaker. And that's just, that is true. And I always marvel at how there's just a level of achievement where they stop and they stop mm. accessing these things. And I don't know if I just grew addicted or derive a lot of joy from personal development and I do, and they just didn't need it. I needed it. Like I, mm. I needed, I was always extroverted, but I needed personal and mental development to achieve anything. And I don't know if I just grew addicted or not, but um, I am, I do always marvel at like there's top tier competitors and they're not using these tools and how much further could they go or how much further exactly. could they push the sport? So let me ask you this. You've been in three Olympics. You're, correct me if I'm wrong, you're training for your final Olympics now, right? Well, I was, and then Corona hit. <laughs> sure. This is my last year, uh, and I had oh, wow. already made the decision to retire after this summer, and then they postponed the Olympics. Wow. And uh, yeah, it, it has been, so talking about personal development, like <laughs> I've really had to step up my game this year. <laughs> wow. So, this, I mean, so did you go through a grieving period? Yeah, I would say so because this was like I was going to go out on a bang because we had yeah. the European Championships also after the Olympics and they have mm -hmm. been canceled. Yeah. So instead of like wow. last year when I decided I'm going to do one more season, mm -hmm. that was going to be, you know, the biggest year of my career, like with the Olympics and then the European Championships and finish on the championships. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden Olympics moved, Europeans gone, and I'm not going to get this like – I've wow. competed at 18 major championships. Now I'm talking Europeans, Worlds, and Olympics. And wow. I was looking at two more, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I had to like, I have to accept that I will not have one more. Like my last one was my last one, and I didn't know it. So that's wow. a little. That was a a little hard pill to swallow, I have to say. But also I had to sit down and kind of rethink my priorities. Like, what am I doing this for? What am I going to do? Because the way that I saw it, I had a few options. I'm like, I can stop now. I can still do this season or I can yeah. go for one more year. But, and that's a tough decision, right? Yeah. And like part of those elements are I made a commitment to myself, regardless of external circumstances, that I was going to retire. And I assumed you had loved ones that you were maybe thinking about giving more attention to. Like everyone hits this level where you're like, you know what? No, I made a commitment regardless of external circumstances. So when you synthesize that and process that, you could spiral pretty hard. Hmm. How, not that you didn't spiral hard, but once you hit whatever bottom you're going to hit there, 
What does turning that energy around to something productive look like for you? Or what did it look this time? I actually didn't spiral and I didn't hit any rock bottom because like I say, this is super tough, but but because of how far along I am in my journey and how well prepared I am. And now it really helps to have been (laughs) focusing (laughs) on like personal development so hard for my company for the last year. But I, I just had to sit down and like the way that I looked at this immediately was just like, okay, my, I choose how I react to this. Yes. I yes. have full power over my reaction right now. Yes. And if I start spiraling and if I start, if I do not accept this and start mm. beating myself down, the only thing that is going to happen is that I will feel horrible. Yeah. That's the, the fact, only net result. <laughs> yeah. Because the fact <laughs> that the Olympics were moved is not going to change no, no matter how hard I beat myself up. So I have a choice. Mm. Am I going to make myself feel bad? Mm. Or am I going to accept this and, you know, feel whatever I'm going to feel, but, yes. you know, accept it and move mm. forward and look at like, okay, this is the situation. What can I do now? Yes. I love this phrase. I, I've used it a lot and I haven't heard someone else use it before. And I'm really touched that you use it. Feel whatever it is you're going to feel. Mm. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you're like me in this. Um, I think other people process emotions maybe differently than you or I do, but people think I don't want them to feel bad. And I'm like, yeah. no, I just want you to feel it. I want you to feel it. I want you to process and synthesize it yeah. and compress that get to its logical outcome as soon as possible feel what you're gonna feel but let's come out on the end and then start channeling that into our steam engine of something else you know whatever's coming next so i i'm super touched that you said that that's huge so then let's talk about this because people might be tempted to put you in the olympic box because that's that's a big accomplishment and i'm sure we could spend hours just talking about excellence in that domain but you've already moved on um (laughs) or are moving on yeah. into your business. So tell me about the business and the context of your education with that business. Let's start with the business. What is your business that you're channeling your energy into? So I am really in the face of, you know, I, I started this company last year with my husband. Mm-hmm. And so I've been on this journey of developing my ideas. The only thing that is super clear is my vision of what I want to do with it Mm. but how I am doing it is constantly developing and we're figuring out the the way so just so I start with the vision that I have is yes like I said all of this work that I have put into personal development setting goals and achieving them working consistently towards them sticking to it staying motivated all of this Mm -hmm. is something that I want to help other people do in their lives so that they can achieve their goals and live their best life Yeah, and have that believe in themselves that they can do whatever they want to do if they mm. want it bad enough. So that's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to help other people feel that and, yeah. you know, achieve and experience that. But I started, I started out, uh, giving talks, mm-hmm. basically just sharing my experience and my methods and mm-hmm. all that. And I quickly realized that, People get super inspired coming to a one hour talk and they're like all up for it. I even made like a little project booklet so they could use my methods afterwards. Yes. But there is no accountability. Oh they, man. They Preach. need to continue. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, <laughs> okay, this yeah. isn't, this isn't enough. What can I do more? Yes. And I'm like, okay, I can, I can have one-on-one sessions. Mm-hmm. I started doing a little bit of coaching. I was also asked to do it. Mm-hmm. And I started doing that and now I am offering like one-on-one goal setting coaching Very good. and with accountability and so on. But mm-hmm. it's also the same, like quickly I realized like, okay, there are only so many hours in the day. Yes. I cannot, if I do this full time, I will not be able to help as many mm-hmm. people as I want to. Yeah. So yes. uh, then I was like, okay, what can I do more? And I actually just released uh, an online course. Oh, It's in Icelandic only. That's why I didn't see it. (laughs) But it's called Achieve Success. The same as my talk. And what I do there is I talk a lot about mindsetting and I teach people how to set goals and like tips and tricks to achieve them. Yeah. 
uh, in my talk. Mm -hmm. So what I did there is that I basically dive deeper into what I talk about in my talk mm. in this course and I give people projects. So yeah. it's, it's really like you can listen to what I say and then you answer questions and you actually apply it in your own life. Yes. Yes. And, and this is a, this is a very good thing. And I actually, I have two talks. I have one for, let's say normal people <laughs> and then <laughs> another one for athletes that is more, yeah. focused on peak performance in athletes. And there I talk about how to deal with injuries, prepare for competition. Obviously, mm. other people who are not athletes are not interested in that. So yeah. then I focus on setting goals in your life. But again, with this course, it was again this like, there is some accountability component that is missing because people are still going to have to go and do the course. Yes. And they're on their, on their own. So I'm like, now I am super pumped and I am preparing, <laughs> I'm preparing to make like a membership. Yes. That is going to be an accountability. There is where I'm going to give a bunch of value. I'm going to help people, give them all the tools to set goals. And then yeah. it's going to be ongoing. It's not just here you buy this course. Good luck. You're on your yeah. own, but it's every month. And I, and I'm, kind of, you know, setting up how exactly I want to do it. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, that's at least right now, I'm like, this is the key. This is how I can actually help people. They have access to me yep. and make it happen and stick to it in the long run. That's the biggest. Oh, yeah. Thing. I, um, you know, coaches are, I guess in this case, motivational speakers or trainers, trainers like us, you know, we all, I don't know if you get this, but I get a lot of flack. I get a lot of pushback of, you know, you're building continuity programs. It's all about the money. You just want more people in your system. And I, you have to fight against that because there's not many people like us that I think have the fire. And I think we serve a role in the species of getting people lit. And you're totally right. As soon as you say yes to yourself and start coaching, you realize they walk out of the room and, if, and ignore it all or encounter mediocrity. And mm. so it's like you have one hour to fight against a lifetime of mediocrity and, a, and, and the next lifetime. So, of course, we want to optimize and we go, okay, well, let's do our courses. I've got courses. I have like I could turn my camera to the dry erase board of my next <laughs> three courses, you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> And then we have like the books, like I have a book called The Top 100 Dream Igniter. It's my method for uh, goal setting. And I'd love yeah, to, yeah. offline, I'd love to talk more about your system oh, yeah. and my system I'd love to share. And eventually you realize you're right about accountability. And I would even say fellowship or competition. And what mm. I mean by that is, I don't know if you're familiar with the English breakdown of the word competition. Most Americans don't know that it means to strive together. Ah, oh, and so if you picture like a rugby group locking arms and yeah. they're competing, but they're also making each other better. Yeah, yeah. And this is why masterminds are so big right now. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So your membership, and and so I think our entire industry of trainers is evolving quickly. And thankful to the coronavirus, yeah. people are used to doing this way more now. Yeah. And there, and there can be solid exchange. I don't think it'll ever replace in-person masterminds or in the, the human touch, but I, I'm glad to hear you iterating or evolving quickly because, mm. you know, I, you know, in a void <laughs> over here, you always doubt like, am I, am I after just the money? I'm like, no, we got to do this in a leveraged way to touch more people, man. We serve yeah. a good role. I'm glad to hear that. And you just launched your new website too, right? Yes. So, so. Ausdistalks.com. That's A S D I S talks.com. And it's in English. Now, I am curious why did you do the first course in Icelandic? I was actually, I had a collaboration going. And okay. I'm part of a little community of a few people very much into all kinds of personal development. It's called mm. Swipe Club Swipe in, Club. in Iceland. Yeah, okay. it's in Icelandic. So this is basically like we are seven individuals and okay. we are all like have our different areas of expertise within personal development. Wow. Like I'm all about the goal setting. One girl, there's about like positive uh, body image. Yes. And then there's one guy who is all about sleep. And then there is like dealing with stress and burnout and wow. you know, all kinds of things. Very and cool. we 
kind of started collaborating mm. and we all came out. So we have, we all have talks and we're grouping together and we are promoting our talks together. And the same way we did the same thing with the courses and we okay. launched those courses now in like a month ago. And that was the reason because I, I was kind of pushed, but now I want to also translate it to English yes. and release it. And I actually want to make another course as well mm -hmm. for athletes. Yes. So I want to have both the kind of here is about goal setting for life. Mm. And then there is more focus, like how can you maximize your performance in your sport? Interesting. Now, so that's interesting to me that even if you have a collaboration, it's in Icelandic. When I when we visited Selfus, we ended mm -hmm. up at this uh, Pilsjör place, you know, and it was like yeah, yeah. we we love the Pilsjör. Like I, I was telling Marissa, <laughs> I was like, we got to go back just for that, like alone. <laughs> um, it's probably not good for me, not keto. Um, but um, there was two old guys uh, at the actually they met there and in the library. We saw them, and they could not tell us enough about how disappointed they were that Icelandic was fading away in the young people and they only spoke English, uh, spoke English. Yeah. And they were, they were loud. They were, they were, it was, it was a big deal to them. And I projected that that was everywhere, but it sounds like a lot of these young people or even middle-aged people, they're still like Icelandic. The language is not fading. So you're not just targeting people that are only speaking Icelandic. That just happens to be, English is not taking over like I thought it was. Is that accurate? I wouldn't say that it's taken over, but mm -hmm. it's still, I think the importance of keeping up Icelandic as a language is the fact that we in the country, we're only 350,000 people yeah. that speak this language. Mm -hmm. So if you start using slang and you start using English, the, mm -hmm. the language can very, very Quickly. fast, like fade away or it can develop. And so... I think it's this like national pride coming from such a small country is like yeah. we need to protect our language. Good. So, and huh. but I I also feel like there is always it's there's always something special about having a course or something like this in your own language. Yes. So I do know that yeah. Icelandic people prefer to see my material in Icelandic. Good. Okay, so I have a little double whammy there because like that means I have to do everything twice. <laughs> yeah, man. That's great practice. That'll keep you nimble though. That'll keep you yeah. mentally active. So, okay. So you're coming out with these other courses. That's huge. And so you have this passion, you have this vision. Now your husband, what does, what does he do? What's his skill? What's his craft? What's his deal? So he uh, owns now uh and runs the family business with his sister. The, that's like an old company that their parents started where they're okay. selling like car parts and oils and battery and stuff like that. So he owns that company and is, that's, okay. his, like, that's his nine to five at the moment and sure. they're developing that company. But he is also a 50% owner in our company. Okay. And he started a few years back taking pictures so he is mm. also a photographer and videographer and he actually he's the one that films and edits all of my video content i was gonna ask yeah he takes all of my pictures <laughs> and everything i'd be my instagram would be lost lost without him <laughs> i was gonna comment you have a great instagram thank you, you you have a great youtube channel and it's just it's so organized all right i mean we with our website company we have about 170 clients that we consistently serve and and the largest chunk of them are coaches and trainers and speakers and you guys for a two-person team it's just the two of you kind of building the brand of how do you say is it anrut 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 media that's kind of the company but the the premise is basically austi's talks right like well it's also it, it's two parts like my part of it is austi's talks and that's all of the motivational speaking and courses and goal setting and coaching and all that mm -hmm. and then we have the anrut media part the media and that is him taking pictures and filming and making videos and mm. and we have been collaborating on a lot of projects for others where we make videos either yeah. sport related or me doing motivational speaking and he does the production mm. of everything wow. and then we can sell the the projects out to you know other companies and that's yeah. that's what we've been doing and this is such a great great opportunity for us mm. to have everything in-house yeah 
and we also work so well together. That's good. And you know, he he's so used to filming and, and shooting mm. me, so it's, <laughs> it works so fast. <laughs> so, what is the what was the biggest challenge when you began thinking about your company? What has been the biggest challenge for the company to date? Oh, for the company. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, I have to say, re relating to the company was just to get over myself and over the hurdle of actually funding the company. <laughs> because like I, the, the funny thing is, like I told you, my, my husband, he comes from a family of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Like his sister has two companies and then his parents had this company and okay. they, they have this entrepreneurial, like he grew up with like, we, we are our own bosses. Gotcha. We're not on a payroll. And okay. I grew up in an environment that was exactly the opposite. It's okay. like, we study something and we get a job and we work nine to five. Yeah, man. And like entrepreneurs, that's, that's a chance. Like starting a company is a chance that somebody, that's what other people, people do. Yeah. Wow. So for me to all of us and start a company, I'm like, I know nothing about running a business. I know <laughs> nothing about marketing and I know nothing about nothing here. <laughs> So that was like the biggest challenge for me is like, yeah. I had no idea about anything relating to running and starting mm. a business. So what were some of the early, what was the biggest early mistakes you made? Oof, I'm probably still making them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm figuring out the marketing piece and I'm yeah. kind of just getting my ideas together yeah. and like making the courses and making all of this. And then Good. I need to put it out. Yes. And and all of this is probably going to be my biggest challenge. I'm, I'm still in it. I'll yeah. talk to you in one or two years and then I'll tell you all about how I did it. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm glad to hear the two things you just said. Um, you're, mar you're focused on marketing. You said the word marketing several times, so it's top of mind. And then you also said producing the thing you produce. Um, I've coached a ton of startup people and um, I'm exposed. There's a co-working space. In fact, the next time you come to Florida, you have to promise me to visit for an afternoon. Oh, I will. Um, I will. And we, uh, we have a great co-working space here called Catapult, and they have hundreds of entrepreneurs. And so as a web developer, as a web developer, a coach, and a speaker, I get to, I get to learn from everyone's experience. I cannot tell you how many entrepreneurs think that their idea was the cool thing and it'll sell itself. And then they micromanage everything else or they, they major on the minors. They don't yeah. market and they don't produce the thing they say they're going to produce. They do everything else. What entity should I have? What, how, what's the perfect website? What's my perfect font? And it's like, man, so I'm glad to hear that you're focused on marketing and you're focused on the product itself. And those are yeah. the only two things in the early days you really need to worry about. Now, once you're making good money, you need to pivot immediately, talk about brand, talk about messaging, talk about target niching. But I'm glad to hear um, that you have a beginner's mind. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> so talk to me, what's the next major goal you're focused on? Well, right now, do you mean with my business or sport or just in general? Well, I mean, I guess I assumed you didn't have a sport focus because things went away. So I guess I was assuming to talk about your business, but what's... Of all of those, what is the biggest goal you're focused on? Uh, okay, right now, I am actually still focusing on my sports because even though all of these big competitions were, were postponed, I've still been training now for you know, all winter, preparing. I'm in the shape of my life, and okay. I want to get it out, <laughs> even <laughs> though there will be no Olympics. Okay. But I want to break my Icelandic record to leave, the, leave that a little bit tougher for the next one to come. <laughs> I go out on a high note. That's the highest note I can go out on as it looks right now. So do you have a date for when you're going to make the attempt? Well, there are going to be uh, several. Like we're okay. going to have some competition during, during the year, like during summer. I, okay. Right now I'm just waiting to get to know exactly when we can start competing because of the corona okay. crisis, everything has been on hold. Sure. But So okay. the, the season is starting – hopefully now in June. In June, okay. So during the summer and maybe even as long as September, October, I will be competing. Interesting. So how much of your time, like percentage-wise, what percent of your time is still in training mode and what percent of your time is on the business? Oh God, percentages. Well, it's basically like <laughs> I, I work in the morning, then sure. I go to training in the afternoon and then sometimes I do some more work like I in see. the when I get back or in the oh. evening. 
And so I don't know really percentages, but like my trainings is about, you know, with trips there and so on, it's about three, three and a half hours a day. Yeah. Wow. And other than that, I'm working. So that's basically how I'm <laughs> spending my time. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So when you do training or when you do uh, the speaking and training, do you have like a message or what are you trying to leave people with? What do you want them to feel? What's the impact you're trying to make in these coaching sessions? Well, I, of course, I am, I want to teach the methods of setting goals and how to achieve them and like the right mindset and like it's all of this, but what I want, the main thing that I want to leave people with yeah. is that you can do anything you want if yes. you want it bad enough. Yeah it is up to you like it's mm. gonna be tough it's gonna be work but you can do it because mm. a lot of people have gotten into a situation where they've maybe set the same goal over and over and over again mm -hmm. and they failed to achieve it and mm. what i'm trying to convey is that that has nothing to do with you it's not because you are the type of person that can't achieve a goal it's okay. because you haven't had the right plan yes so that is that is the big thing that i'm trying to convey and is mm. this getting the confidence and believe in yourself and having the right mindsets yeah. and then you can then you just need to figure out what you want to do and make the plan interesting but, so you think the plan literally the tactics is is the no, is normally the problem is that is that kind of your framework i mean I think that the reason people fail at achieving goals is like, I'm going to say like 99% the plan, but there's a lot of things that are involved in the plan. Yeah. Like it's not just the steps that you're going to take, but it's also like, are you setting yourself up for success? What are you planning around it? How are you mm -hmm. setting your life up? Like all of that is your strategy and your yeah. plan to achieve the goal. So it's wow. not just like writing down step by step what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. but I, I really think like, of course it's, I mean, yeah, I think that if you work towards it, mm -hmm. like, I can't say that you can actually do anything. I can't like, if you're like, I yeah. want to be an Olympic champion, I can't tell you that you can do it, but I can tell you that if you make a plan and you consistently work towards it, you damn sure will be closer than you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, closer than you were right now. And I, I find yeah. that, the toughest thing that I've had in my coaching is teaching people um, the paradox of setting big goals that they might be scared yeah. of, but also being okay when you miss that mark and reframing a failure as how much further along are you now than you were before. I meet yes. a lot of people who stop set. They started setting goals, but they quit setting goals because they missed an important yeah. goal to them. And they quit because goal setting doesn't work. Yes, and I exactly. think we have to teach the dualism that, mm -hmm. yes, we're going to set a goal and there is no option but winning until we lose. Once we lose, you're allowed to reframe it. But I think some exactly. people feel like they're lying to themselves of reframing a failure. And I think that we have a challenge in front of us as coaches and trainers to help them successfully reframe failure if that makes sense yeah i always say you you either win or you learn like there is no <laughs> losing yeah like, man. That you if you don't reach a goal you need to then you just sit down and take a look at the situation and what can i learn from it what can i do differently because yeah. that was the plan and then you adjust the plan and you try again yeah this man is the thing because wow. it's it's so it's so common that people do this and maybe even mm. they set a goal that is too big. Yeah. And you know, you just need to break it down and have a smaller steps because otherwise it can get very overwhelming. Yes. And then you get discouraged and then you stop trying. So yeah. if you just take a smaller bite at a time, mm -hmm. that's how you can do it. And that's what I mean by adjusting the plan. That's a part of the plan. Got it. It's breaking the big goal down mm -hmm. into like a lot of milestones. Yes. I always use this analogy is like when you're standing below the mountain yeah. and you're about to start your hike and you look up at the peak, it looks so far away. Yes. And if you're, if you're like looking up and like, it's so easy to think I'm never going to make it all the way up there. Mm -hmm. but that's not what you do when you go on a hike. You're like, oh, I'm going to go up to that stone and then that yeah. stone and then that stone. And then all of a sudden you're at the top. Yeah. So this is what you have to do with your goals as well. Yeah. Um, man. And I also, call it chunking. Like we call it yeah. chunking. Like 
for me, I get inspired when I think of like big goals. Like I'm inspired by, by daunting goals. Most people yeah. are not, but uh, chunking or what you're talking about, doing it in steps. Um, I like the idea of chunking because it seems like I want you to take a big bite out of this thing. It needs to be challenging, not baby steps, maybe big steps, you know, but it's got to be just challenging enough. But I do find that if goals are too big, it has the opposite effect on most other people mm -hmm. where it's just, yeah. they can't even fathom how they would do that. So I like this idea of planning. That's huge. But this is the thing with like, there are two different types of people. There are the people like you, they want like a huge challenge. And they're yeah. like, if it isn't a challenge, it's not interesting. Yep. But then you have the other people and these are, often the ones that have failed many times before mm -hmm. if your confidence is low yeah then you need to start by building up your confidence and the way that you yes. do that building is to break down the goals into steps i always say break your goals down into steps so small that it's not worth not doing them <laughs> so it's like tiny, I like that. tiny tiny little step like you know if you want to start exercising just say i'm gonna go out for a walk for 10 minutes I like that. It's not worth not doing it, but I can promise you once you're out and you've been walking for 10 minutes, you're like, I'm going to roll here. I'm going to go another <laughs> lap and I'm going to go for 20 or 30. Yeah, man. That's so small. It's not worth not doing. I like that, yeah. man. Austies, I'm taking that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you got to credit me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Well, I think we're past time here and I, I feel like we could actually dive into a lot of stuff. So I'm going to commit to having you on again, as you, especially as you expand in this business, because I'm very curious to see how someone who could be pigeonholed as an Olympian channels that energy and that framework into other fields. And I really feel honored to be at this stage of your journey to watch how that goes. So I'm excited. So where Thank can you. people follow you? Where do you want them to check you out? All right. I'm... I put most of my energy of social media into Instagram. Okay. So it's Astis Helms. You're going to probably have to put that in some notes. I'll put it, I'll put it in the yeah. notes. So it's Austis Helms at Instagram and Austis Talks at Facebook and okay. YouTube. And I'm, YouTube. Uh, I have some videos on my YouTube channel, but we're actually focusing on putting in more like short value videos in there okay. now. So that's going to get more interesting. And then, of course, it's AustisTalks.com. AustiesTalks.com. Well, I really, I sincerely appreciate you coming on. Had a great time. And uh, maybe, I can't wait. Go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I should actually mention that if people want to see my talk, yeah, they can do that. Both of them. Okay. Because they're on my website. You can okay. go and like just rent access to them. You can great. see see them for, I think it's about $10. Okay. And because uh, I had to record them because of Corona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then I thought, well, that gives me the opportunity because I've been doing this for groups, but now individuals can see them as well. So if people want to see cool. my talks, it's austiestalks.com slash talks, or you just go into the website and you'll see it. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you. We'll definitely have you back and we'll check out your talks. And for those watching, make sure you keep checking back for awesome discussions like this with people like Austies, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care. Take care.